Hi, everyone, everywhere around this world. I want to thank all of you who have been coming to my Earth Files YouTube channel every week and to encourage new visitors tonight to click on that red arrow to subscribe right now because we are so close to breaking through to 187,000 subscribers just since last week when we broke through 186,000. All of your steady increasing support gives me energy to connect with you each week with news and firsthand interviews from military, scientists, and other professionals with firsthand knowledge that confirms we are not alone in this universe. Tonight, I want to begin with where we left off last week with the UFO encounter and abduction in mid-November of 1977 of U.S. Air Force senior airman and nuclear security policeman Mario Woods. Four months later, on April 1, 1978, Mario Woods would receive this certificate of appointment to sergeant rank as a non-commissioned officer in the United States Air Force while based at Ellsworth Air Force Base in South Dakota. And by March 1983, he would receive his staff sergeant stripe before he retired from the Air Force. This map shows Ellsworth Air Force Base near Rapid City, South Dakota. At the top of the map is the U.S. Air Force November 1 Minuteman Launch Control Facility, also known as an LCF. It is about 62 miles northwest of Ellsworth Air Force Base. The actual nuclear missiles connected to that launch control facility are 60 feet underground in the U.S. Air Force November 5 Minuteman missile site, only seven miles southwest of the November 1 LCF. Between November 1 and November 5 is Newell Lake, represented by the blue circle only 11 miles from the small town of Newell. It was 1 a.m. local time when Mario Woods and his November 1 launch control facility leader, Michael Johnson, received a Situation 4 alert. That SIT-4 alarm meant the inner perimeter around an underground nuclear missile at the November 5 missile site had been penetrated by an unknown. This was two and a half hours after Senior Airman Woods, between 9.30 to 10.15 p.m. that night, had seen a light in the night sky flash lights off and on, provoking him to flip off and on a network of 14 very bright perimeter security lights around that November 1 launch control facility. To Mario's surprise, the mystery sky object copied Mario's light switch sequence of flash, 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 flash. So Mario asked his partner, Michael Johnson, in the November 1 launch control facility to take a look at the puzzling sky object. Johnson, the LCF leader, blew it off. So for the next two and a half hours, the men watched television in the launch control office. Until that SIT-4 alarm went off at 1 a.m. from the November 5 nuclear missile site near Newell, South Dakota, only about four miles from the November 1 launch control facility. Quickly, Mario Woods and Michael Johnson got in their Air Force truck and headed for November 5 to find out what set off that alarm. When they got to November 5 near Newell, they could see a reddish glow on the horizon like the sun was coming up, but they thought their clocks and watches had just showed near 1 a.m. As they got closer, Mario realized the red-orange glow was coming from a round craft, quote, the size of a Walmart superstore hovering only 10 feet above the November 5 missile site, close quote. When their U.S. Air Force truck reached a metal cattle guard embedded in the dirt, the truck stopped moving. 
Mario saw that Michael Johnson was clutching the steering wheel, looking straight ahead, not blinking or answering any of Mario's questions about the gigantic orange-red UFO in front of them. It was as if Michael Johnson was paralyzed holding on to the steering wheel. Senior Airman Woods then saw three non-human beings with large black eyes and skin the blue-green color of teal approaching the truck. Behind them was a taller being about five and a half to six feet tall. Mario heard in his mind a telepathic voice that sounded like it was kind of underwater. Quote, Do not fear. Do not fear. We won't hurt you. Close quote. Then suddenly, like a jump cut in a movie where the scene just changes, Mario felt like he was moving in the air on his back about three to four feet above the ground, but nothing was holding him up. It was only air. Then he saw and felt something black and cold that reminded him of jello. Some other human abductees over the years have also described a jello substance in UFOs that they are told is a disinfectant for germs. Then came another jump cut from the cold, dark gel to Mario seeing the sun rising in the east. His watch showed it was after 6 a.m., but in his mind, it had just been 1 a.m. What happened in those five missing hours? Shocked and confused, Mario could see in the early morning sunlight a large white wall he had never seen before. That white wall, I didn't know this at the time, I'd never been there before, was the backside of the Newell Lake Reservoir Dam that's north of Newell and about 11 miles away from November 5. And I had no idea what this white wall was. Well, lo and behold, the backside of that reservoir goes down about 40 to 50 feet. And as you get closer to the edge, that edge goes up 10 to 20 feet, and then you're on level ground. It's a great big, huge berm on the backside of that New Lake Reservoir. And we were at the bottom of that, sitting on it. Had we driven down in there, there's no place to turn around because there's about a 50-foot drop-off into another lake that's the runoff area for that dam, and there's nowhere to turn a vehicle around that it would never have been possible for you to have driven your military vehicle there in November of 1977. That is correct. Still couldn't do it today. There's no way that a vehicle could turn around down there because it's just straight down off to the side to your right. The implication is that the teal bluish beings transported you out of the military vehicle that you were in with Michael Johnson. Correct. Do you have any insights now about why the entities would have transported you to that narrow place in the reservoir? Yes, I believe that when I first spotted that craft, when I walked out of November 1 launch control facility that night, I believe they were directly above it or right next to the Newell Reservoir Dam itself. I don't know what they would be doing there, but as the crow flies, that's where about they were located as if they took me to a point where I first observed them. And that was the flashing of the lights where all of this started and you thought it was a joke with some helicopter pilots. Yes, ma'am. And then why I used that mag light to ask for relief for what was happening to me. I just think they were the ones that were sent because that craft was much larger <laughs> just of only holding three beings. That craft was filled with stuff. And I've had dreams since that about the inside of that thing. What did you dream? I've dreamt I've been in a room where there's all kind of artifacts from Earth, like box TVs and old radios and antennas and all this stuff sitting up on shelves. The first thing I saw was an old black and white box television set, probably a 19 by 19, something like that, with the knobs on the right side of the cabinet and the old style wood grain that was plastic. And I put my hand on it, and next to it was a sewing machine and a selector type typewriter below it, a radio, 
a pedestal kind of light that people used to put from the floor to the ceiling. All this stuff was extremely old, and I just found it fascinating to be where I was. I was like, oh, wow, you've got one of these. You've got this IBM selected typewriter. You are describing that you saw in some kind of a dream or in your mind's eye a section inside this craft that was filled with 20th century human technology. Yes. Did you ask any of them in your mind, what is this for and why have you taken me? No. I said, why do you have all this old stuff? I remember saying that. I don't believe I got an answer, but they had me come with them down this hallway. And that's when I noticed the walls that were so active with circuits and lights. I didn't feel fear at the time. I was kind of amazed of the things that I saw in there. I mean, there was some really strange old stuff that we've used all of our lives, you know? Like archaeologists from another planet came here, and they were stuffing the UFO with technologies to study. They did tell me when they put me there, you can look out the window. And I was afraid to look out the window. I didn't know what I'd be looking at. The earth or something else, you know? I really wish I would have now, but I've had dreams that have never gone away that I've dreamt over and over and over. And I've dreamt of this situation and this whole thing that I've told you probably 50 times in my life in the last 43 years. And every time I wake up and sweat, but I only know that in that room, I did not feel fear. The only time I felt fear was when I was having a lot of pain in my right wrist. And I still have pain in that wrist today. I don't know why. In the 50 dreams or so that you've had about seeing that room with all of the 20th century technology pieces stuck in it on what must have been the big UFO craft, have you ever been given an insight from your dreams about why they, the non-humans, would be taking technologies from the 20th century and why they were there near Ellsworth Air Force Base interacting with you and Michael Johnson? I don't know. When I followed them, I kept looking at things as I'm walking out of that room because I found it so interesting because it was things that I had interfaced with, like box TVs where we changed the channel on it. I come out of this room, and I don't remember going through a door, but I remember in this short hallway, and the hallway was really tall. It was about six or eight foot wide, but it was really tall. We turned to the left, And as I followed, we went to another doorway, and the door opened. It did not open with a swing-type door, but opened with a slide door. And it was already open when I got there. I felt as if I put my hand up on the frame of the doorway. And as I looked in, it was like fog in the whole area. And I was up in the fog, too, and I couldn't really see. And then it felt as if someone either took me by the hand or said this way, and I kept walking forward. But when I looked up, way up, then I saw this gargantuan interior that was multi-layered. It was like the whole interior of this craft had like rooms all over the walls. I mean, as far up as you could see, because it's just huge. But it was as if you're looking at a model of a house, and it's cut in half, and you see the open rooms in each level. Mm-hmm. It was like that. All these little guys were everywhere. Well, do you think now as we speak in early October of 2021, looking back at this event in November of 1977, that what the beings were trying to do was communicate to you, we have gathered this from you, from your planet, and that they are waiting maybe for reaction from you about these, but the bottom line is they are basically communicating We study your planet. We gather from your planet. You are now on our craft, and we are showing you some of what we have taken from your planet, and you we have taken from your planet. (laughs) There were so many other items. There were trophies in that room. There were just all kinds of things, and some of them on the upper shelves were not stationary. They were floating They were above the shelf, just kind of hanging there, floating. Like neutralized gravity. Yes. The TV did that. As I touched it, it moved. It had no weight to it. 
meaning that they have the ability to control gravity and inertial forces around any matter object that they want to. I would say so. What do you think the tall and short teal blue beings want from Earth and from humans? I think the tall beings are the ones with the true mission or knowledge of what their mission is on this planet and who they're trying to please, I don't know. And the short beings are simply the guys that carry out what they want done. I don't think the short guys can grow up to be tall ones. I think they're two different species. I think they're like symbiotic. I don't think you see one without the other. Maybe they're protectors. I honestly don't know. In abduction cases, there has been more clarity about the taller gray beings perhaps being organic, but that all of the shorter beings, two feet, three feet, four feet, are artificial intelligence, cyborgs, androids, robots. Honestly, the look in their eyes, I don't know if their eyes are a filter, but when I was in that craft, I saw beings without those filters, and there were pupils there. I guess it's something that they can close or open, depending upon the light around them. But their pupils were extremely large, and they were round. They weren't reptilian or anything like that. So I wondered if it's a filter of some type. But there seemed to be, in all my midst of fear, or the feelings that I was feeling, there seemed to be life there. I'm not sure if they were robots or not, but they didn't seem to be mechanical. Their movements seemed to be not quite smooth and not animated either, but they don't seem to move very fluid. So you might have something there. Right. Some are robots, mechanical. Some are androids, biological, cyborgs, machine, and biological. And then the tall grays, and gray is just a name now, like a common noun, because yours were not gray. We humans are limited by lack of knowledge. And that's what makes this important to ask you. What do they want from Earth and humans? I believe understanding. I think they want to know what really makes us kick, what makes us warring, maybe our innermost thoughts, our innermost fears, our innermost everything, because I do think that they can separate the mind or the soul from the body and analyze it in a way that we can't even imagine. And that's why I associate these out-of-body experiences that I had directly after this whole thing happened that, that very day before I was even taken back to Ellsworth Air Force Base. I went into a restroom. I thought I was going to pass out. At November 1, launch control, I felt really strange. I felt as if I was going to leave my body. And I went and laid down, and I kind of settled myself down, and I remember my heart beating, and I felt as if I was moving down through my body toward my feet. And then I came back real quick, and I got back up and walked back out in the day room, and everybody was there asking me questions, and my buddy Michael Johnson, he was still out of it, and he was sitting in a chair. And I think the site cook was trying to get him to drink something, and they were really just trying to take care of him because we had a medical problem with him and didn't know what it was. This is Michael Johnson, who was not functioning in the truck. Correct. Did you ever see him active and normal after that? Two weeks later, he came to my apartment in Rapid City. For him to find me, he had to go find somebody that knew me and knew where I lived because we didn't all know each other. And he came to my apartment. Well, I knew at that time that he was not going back out into the missile field. He was not going back out as a security policeman. I don't know if he was disqualified medically or what exactly happened. But we sat down and we talked. He told me how freaked out he was. And he did remember, do not fear, do not fear. And he was just literally locked up. He couldn't speak. It was really mentally disturbing to see a grown man, you know, to not be able to function because of something that he's seeing. I think that the most interesting thing was once we drew without looking at each other, he went to my kitchen table and I sat on the coffee table and we drew what we saw. Drew the vehicle just like the drawings of which I sent you and the craft sitting over the site. He said, I saw your glove on a shiny floor. And I said, what are you talking about? Remember, I, when I clutched the bubble on top of that security police vehicle, I used my left hand and I had a glove on it. Right. He asked me if I had my right glove. I went and grabbed my bag and I threw it out on the couch, just dumped it. Well, the left hand glove was there, but my right hand glove was gone. He told me he saw my glove laying on a shiny floor. So 
So that's when we both looked at each other and where in the hell were we on a shiny floor? Mario, what is so important is what you were doing with that one gloved hand was you were reaching for the mag light because you were going to go beep, 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 beep to whatever was in the huge red orange craft. (laughs) That's right. And it was the same sequence that I used at November 1 when I flipped the facility lights at it. I just went blip, blip, blip. No sequence. No SOS. None of that stuff. Just it was asking for relief of the pressure and the vacuum in that vehicle. Right. Because they sucked all the air out of that vehicle, and the light was so intense that I could barely look up at it. And I did have burns on the right side of my face and the back of my right hand, and that's where skin samples from the flight surgeon's office after my interview with all those people back at Ellsworth Air Force Base. That's where he took the skin sample from above my right eye and two samples off the back of my right hand. Yes, and is it possible that these beings are so complex that they cannot do everything they want to do unless humans give them some kind of signal of permission, and that when you struggled with that one gloved hand to get yourself pulled up so that you could lift up the mag light and do those flashes of light, in a way you may have been saying, I am here I give you permission, and that's when they took you and perhaps Michael. In my mind, honestly, when I did that, I knew, they knew it was me that flipped those damn facility lights at them back in November 1. I know they knew it. Right. And then I slid down on that seat, and then it all went from there. This leads to, what do you think our Earth future will be? Did you get any pictures in your mind on that big craft about what they showed you of what they were going to do, wanted to do, any intention about Earth and the future? A picture comes to my mind where I'm standing at a window frame and I'm looking out of a window. And off in the distance, I see a huge nuclear explosion and a mushroom cloud just comes, just a fireball just erupts from the ground. And I'm looking straight out at it, and I think, I've got to run. And then in that same thought, I realize, where am I going to run to? Besides the -the out-of-the-body experiences that particular day, that was the next closest memory that I had of visualization of anything from this whole ordeal. I see this mushroom cloud through a window. Was there anything about the moment and where you were that might relate to the beings trying to communicate something to you about the nuclear explosion? This could possibly be your future if things are not changed. If peace doesn't come into this world, this could possibly be everybody's future. I asked Mario why he thought that those advanced teal skin beings would take the air out of their Air Force truck. And he told me that perhaps it was because they wanted to take control of him and Michael, his colleague, that they actually were strategizing what to do around the people that they wanted in their craft and that taking the air out of the truck would then have disabled the humans in the truck to a certain point that they would be easier to handle by the small teal ones that came first, followed by the taller one. That was at least Mario's hypothesis about why would they suck the air out of that truck. And I also wanted to share, I have been getting uh, from chats last week, just in one week, several of you have either had a military background or someone in your family has had a military background or some kind of aerospace engineering or science. And it is fascinating, the comments that I have received just this week. And I wanted to start out with It's called Ray's Story. You'll recognize who you are who sent this particular uh, chat comment. I worked with a former U.S. Air Force serviceman 
who told me that Mario's report, and that would have been last week's part one on September 29th, and today is part two, October 6th, told me Mario's report was true and that he was one of the two personal people who had a launch key and code that were needed and that launch drills had problems after radar detected UFO presences over and over. We were both working on a cable fault team for the Department of Defense and I knew him well as we spent a lot of time working together. Here is a chat comment from Quantum FX. We still have a lot of activity near the Iosco County, Michigan, Wurtsmouth Air Force Base. Even as this base has been shut down for years, it was shut down from uh, in 1993, but went all the way back to 1923. So uh, Wurtsmouth Air Force Base in Iosco County, Michigan, went from 1923 through World War II and everything up to 1993, and then it was uh, decommissioned. And he says that even though it has been decommissioned and shut down, we still have many sightings here. I have wondered if a lot of it is just our aircraft or is it mixed both with UFOs? After experiencing what I have seen with another person driving at night behind this old base, I know at least we encountered something that is not ours. This triangle was hovering during a lightning storm on an angle and no sound at all. And then it disappeared right after the entire road and the area around the road lighted up like day as if the lightning had stayed on for about 20 some seconds. I have no idea why we still have active sightings here other than maybe they, the non-humans in the UFOs, keep an eye on this base so they don't have any concerns about weapons being here, meaning I suppose that a decommissioned base would be a perfect hiding place for materials underground and no one would suspect. And three, this is from Michael Wason. My dad worked on a Minuteman sites for years on a Boeing contract. And here is something that I have never found reference to. My father was security cleared to a high level at Boeing and with Air Force projects. And probably in the mid 1960s, Boeing cut a large commercial type aircraft in half and then installed a super high resolution camera in the gap where they had cut the plane in half. The camera could go around the circumference of the plane on rails and swivel all over the place. It was built to get pictures, photos of UFOs in Alaska, which at the time were giving the Air Force trouble up there. My dad worked on all kinds of stuff, including the first Minuteman missile. I truly welcome hearing more feedback about UFOs and nukes, histories, UFOs, intrusions, from those of you who have either served in the military with firsthand information and knowledge, such as Sergeant Mario Wood, or you do have relatives or family uh, who can help fill in some of the firsthand experiences about this enormous subject of intelligences from someplace else in the universe who have come here, who have been intensely interested in what happened in World War II with the atomic bombs, and then the missile bases became a focus in the 60s and the 70s up to the 80s in which the UFO phenomena has demonstrated its ability to even control what would be the magnetic tape information as were in the Minuteman missiles back in the 70s. That my own brother uh, was at Malmstrom Air Force Base 
and he knew firsthand and told me firsthand that when a football field-sized orange fluorescent huge UFO set down on Kilo 7 in 1975, and he was in the air in a helicopter taking some uh, senior authorities out to meet with the sabotage alert team, that the, when, the, when this huge UFO, which was being tracked on radar, and there were jets in the sky, and my brother's in the helicopter, and sabotage alert team, and the big, huge UFO close down above Kilo 7 just suddenly and you've probably heard Luis Elizondo and others in uh, since the 180-day countdown uh, having to do with um, UFO information, how they have talked about the ability of technologies in our skies, in our water, under the ground, on the moon, through the solar system, that can move at these tremendously accelerated speeds in an instant and, and then be gone, something that humans could never survive and that human technology would never yet know how to make. So to me, we're, we are moving like a crescendo in music. There's more and more people who have professional backgrounds and know very well that extraterrestrial biological entities in many shapes, sizes, colors, uh, from different solar systems, different galaxies, interact in our particular galaxy. And here in our solar system, on our Earth, and I would love to see news that would finally be telling the truth and talking about what we are learning from solar systems that are between our Earth and the Sun and out a hundred light years. It's happening, it's already happening, but we're being left out. And I hope my being able to share information like tonight and last uh, week and uh, others that I have had on from the military background, I hope that you are feeling how valuable these facets, they're facets, they're not whole, they don't answer all the questions, but they are facets of firsthand experience and knowledge without any question of working with a variety of different beings with extremely advanced technologies who seem to be studying us, monitoring us, harvesting our genetics, harvesting metals from inside our planet. And it's all going on while we have this strange, historic, superimposed denial of truth, telling us that we are the only intelligent life in this universe. It is now past being preposterous. It is way past telling the truth. That's why I honor Sergeant Mario Woods and all of the military people who have been uh, speaking out finally, and some of the scientists who have talked to me confidentially, engineers who have talked to me confidentially, and I just hope that it's going to be much sooner than later that we finally have this tsunami of truth wash over this planet, and I think in the end that those have argued humans can't take it. It's nonsense. It could actually help us look at each other, as we've talked about on this program before. It might actually help Homo sapiens sapien to look at its fellow brother, sister, and say, I don't want you gone. I don't want humans gone from Earth. And that may be what's at stake, which is exactly what Mario Woods and others in the last two or three years, there are more and more people having dreams, having the movies, having the slideshow about some kind of a atomic, a bomb, 
And the sense is that we're at branches in a timeline. If we go one way, we will maybe survive and things will thrive and we will finally get the kind of civilization that we have always hoped, where freedom and will and loving in an agape way our fellow brothers and sisters on the planet, no matter what country, no matter what skin, no matter what hair, that we would honor and respect our species, which seems so difficult today. And behind all of this is the question of how insidious could some intelligences be out there, that they're working overtime trying to keep us separated, keep us fighting each other, keep us in mindless, stupid, separate factions. Because they want the earth, they want us gone, have Homo sapiens sapiens destroy themselves and then it's all over. I just cannot believe that you, the divine field, want that to happen. So let's smile and transition to your comments and your questions that I look forward to every week, knowing we are in a very serious part of Earth's history. And we're in a decade that has been described for a long time as one that was really going to be difficult. But maybe if we all began to concentrate on more positive frequencies, maybe the human minds on Earth could change a future. I pray for that every day. Hey, Ian, what's up? Linda. Well, that was a fantastic report. Oh, thank you. I've got to first of all go through my list of super chats. So thank you for your generosity this evening. Moonbird called PC. Yeah, you are TV. something. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Ackley, uh Lisa Collins, Sweet Cheeks, Sexy Sadie, Whisper of Love. And Wellman Osario. I think I've probably missed a few out there, but thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. So, so much. And I will welcome your feedback on this part one and part two with Maria Woods. I would like to hear from everybody uh, about what, where does this uh, strike you, I guess, in the sense of you know yourselves, you know what your inner core is, you know when you have an effect, an impact in yourself that maybe is at a soul level as well as a mind and mental level. And I would like to know what your, all your reaction is to this part one and part two, coming from somebody who worked with nuclear missiles, knows what he's talking about, and then ends up having been abducted and come back to talk about what happened. Um, I would love to know if you feel like you are beginning to hear this kind of information now in 2021, almost to 2022, as we would listen to a news report, let's say a long time ago, but people would never have been, uh, probably had any context for any of this, let's say if they were listening to this story in the 1950s. And that's what I'm wondering. Do you feel that we have literally moved far enough in 2021 as far as you all are concerned? Where does this hit you? How much of a feeling of this is true and the whole world needs to know it? How much of that is resonating with you? or any other else. So thank you, Ian, and thanks everybody. And let's go to questions. Okay, just before we go to questions, you asked me yeah. to tell you oh, yes. who was calling in and, and where people were. Yes. We've got uh, people calling in from all over the United States and Canada, of course, but we've also got people this evening calling in and uh, making themselves known from the Czech Republic, Croatia, Greece, 
plenty of people as well from New Zealand and Australia, Brazil, Hawaii, and, uh, and of course, everyone else in the UK, Wales and Scotland as well. Oh, welcome, you guys. If we were all relating to each other all the time as fellow humans, and that the boundaries just separated parts of the earth so that we could go visit places that were different from where we lived. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that was the atmosphere of earth again? Let's pray for it. Okay, Ian, go ahead. Okay, well, we'll go straight to questions. Uh, first of all, let's see this. If, if we were told by the government that there was an ET presence here that could shut down our nukes and outwit us in every way, some people may well freak out. My brain always in this entire story, going back to the first time that I talked with Bob Salas, who I started in part one explaining that on October 19th, not very far from here, he's going to be in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club. He is going to have uh, witnesses, experiencers, military people talking about what has happened from a UFO nuke uh, history point of view. And Bob Salas would say that he knew what it was like to be threatened. You will have to see a psychiatrist. He said no. This is when he was down 60 feet underground. Uh, Faded, Faded Giant is his book about this. He was 60 feet underground in 1967, I believe is his year. And a sabotage alert team up above uh, calls down to him and says there's a big red glowing UFO and it is sitting right above the gate. And they even joked like, like it's being polite and saying we are stopped at your gate. But what do we do? Well, that was the uh, March 24th, 1967, when Bob Salas was underground when 10 of our Minutemen nuclear missiles went down one steam engine, two steam engine, three steam engine, four steam engine, five steam engine, six steam engine, seven steam engine, eight steam engine, nine steam engine, 10. 10 seconds that fast, nuclear missiles powering down. Boeing said it was impossible. Boeing engineer, I talked with him directly. He said, what happened is impossible. We built these systems. It's not possible, but it happened. And they acknowledged it happened. They just said it was impossible. Well, Bob, who at that time, that, that's going back a way, is 67. He personally, he's written about it talk with me about it, that they said they wanted him to see a psychiatrist. And he was smart and knew that this must be some ruse, that if they got some kind of a psychiatric interview or analysis, it would go in his record. And then, depending upon what happened in the world between UFOs and missiles and the governments and everything, they could pull out a psychiatric interview and say, see, he's crazy, go away. Well, that has been a threat to a lot of people who have served in various kinds of capacities with sensitive material, and it's not fair. And fortunately, Bob Salas, uh, he was smart and he avoided that. Well, he still, if he, uh, I don't know what exactly uh, his whole content is going to be on October 19th in Washington, but I know that he himself has stressed that for professionals who have had the responsibility of our most sensitive and dangerous weapons, nuclear missiles, the people who have been responsible for the launch control facilities, for everything involved with them, they became so afraid to say anything about what they knew of these impossibly advanced craft. And in a few cases, Mario is not the only one, 
uh, with Michael Johnson to have been abducted. There have been others, but he's the first one to really go on the record with so much detail. And the climate, it was the, the psychological climate. You talk about this and you will be destroyed. You talk about this and you will never be employed again. You talk about this and your life will be, be smashed. And that is the attitude, that is the context that has kept so many of these interactions between another intelligence, live conscious intelligence in this universe that has been interacting with this planet for at least 270 million years, as I understand it from a man who uh, I've talked about here in December of 1999, res uh, was retiring from the Defense Intelligence Agency after an entire career of studying, monitoring, and analyzing the presence of three competing extraterrestrial civilizations on this planet. So the disconnect in 2021, soon to be 2022, the disconnect about what the true reality of this universe is, that we are a life form out of a myriad of life forms, and the growing consensus that is coming to me from scientists, sometimes on the record and often off the record, boils down to this. Linda, the universe, the entire universe is conscious. The suns are conscious. The moons are conscious. Everything is conscious. The key is frequencies. The key is learning. We're still, we've been kept in babyhood, apparently on purpose by others with advanced intelligences for reasons that are not clear. And then our own human governments keep us even more blind. But there may be something now that is breaking if we could keep the inertia going forward. If we've got, if we've got 8 billion human minds on Earth, if we understood that war alone cuts off the ability for the human consciousness to interact positively with the universe. And if we're kept in a state of war, we will never make that wonderful connection on the positive side. So there is a much bigger picture about having the truth be told that would begin to change the entire consciousness relationship between Homo sapien sapien and this universe. Scientists, I've had discussions with scientists that they completely concur. They're, they're studying this. So if we have allies, which I presume that we do because humanity is still alive, if we have allies they may have been trying to help us and guide us in a variety of ways toward making connections with the fact that the soul, as Mario has feels strongly since these experiences when he was something was trying to pull him out of body and he became very aware of the substance of his soul. There is a substance to the soul when you feel it and then you recognize it. And we're not taught any of this. And that if we, 8 billion of us, could go past war and conflict, if we actually could shift gears and start learning and educating and strengthening our soul's relationship with the universe, it really might turn this unstable planet into that old phrase, heaven on earth. It's such a critical time. I think everybody feels it. Pandemic or no pandemic, it is a critical time. And there is something about talking with Mario and hearing him and 
being able to talk with him in the interview that gives me more hope. And I hope it gives you hope too. Okay, Ian. Linda, you've spoken before about your sighting in Colorado of the craft uh, that you witnessed. Yeah. And people have asked, have you ever had a close encounter experience yourself? And here's another question. Have you ever had regression th therapy yourself to see if you've had an experience or abduction that you don't recall? I was hypnotized in 1985 by... Richard Sigismund in Boulder, Colorado, a very close friend to J. Allen Hynek. And Richard Sigismund had helped me tremendously in my production of A Strange Harvest when I was hitting all of this for the very first time in September of 1979 and produced the 90 minute special A Strange Harvest about the animal mutilations and was meeting law enforcement telling me the perpetrators were creatures from outer space with all this advanced technology of beams that ranchers were seeing the cattle go up in the beams and being put down. And Richard Sigismund invited me to go to a hypnosis session that he was doing with a couple. It's featured in my An Alien Harvest, my first book, with photographs of what the, the man was a commercial artist, and he could sketch under hypnosis. And watching them, and we, we worked with them for over a year, kept the husband separate from the wife. We would do uh, different uh, isolated hypnosis sessions. Uh, we, we asked them not to talk with each other. And as we got through the, the separate uh, hypnosis sessions over that year, I asked him, I said, would you, would you do a hypnosis session with me on uh, a, a particular incident that I wanted to explore? And... I went through, and the thing that I remember saying to him, both when I thought I was uh, conscious and after, is, I don't think I'm hypnotized. Well, people will say that as they're going under. And he ran a tape recording, and I have that tape recording to this day, and that I know everything that happened on that tape recorder, and the tape recorder the material on that tape is more understandable that, that I feel that I was describing to Richard Sigismund events and places that are, were very accurate and I still have it and related to my investigations of animal mutilations and if it was extraterrestrial biological entities doing the, the uh, bloodless mutilations what does that say about the non-humans? What is their true relationship with the earth? How far back does it go? And I will share one piece of that hypnosis session that I think is absolutely accurate, that I had been shown in, a, in material that was allegedly part of the big classified secret documents of information that are in Suitland, Maryland, and all these places underground. Everything that we want to know and deserve to know, it's all underground in these big archives. One part on the tape recording under the hypnosis when I thought I wasn't hypnotized was my seeing the words in this document. I mean, like, I, like they were right in front of me like I was reading a book. And it was this particular paragraph, it was about that the dinosaurs were a genetic manipulation by extraterrestrial biological entities on this planet Earth because they perceived this planet as a laboratory and that all of those um, millennia that the dinosaurs were on the planet, it was an laboratory experiment. 
you've heard me talk about the DIA guy in 1999. That was his information to me that three competing civilizations have been here for 270 million years and that one, the Greys, had been responsible for the creation of the dinosaurs and the overseeing of the genetic experiments on this planet for 270 million years leading up to us. And his question that I've shared with you guys before, that's one track. The hypnosis in that paragraph about dinosaurs, that's another track. And that the DIA guy coming out of what he had been exposed to raised the question with me that we talked about. We've seen the Greys demonstrate that they can move any matter from inside this universe into a parallel time or another dimension. It's gone from here. And they could have done that with a six mile diameter asteroid. Why didn't they? Was that the way that they chose knowing everything that their computers advance would know that if they had a six mile diameter uh, meteorite slam into uh, the Gulf, would it create enough forces that it would then decimate their dinosaur experiment and then later on they would do something else? He, he posed that question to me. And in, that was 1999. I never told him, I never told him in that seven hours, but I thought about 1985, Richard Sigismund having me in hypnosis about this event and a document and my seeing the page as if I were reading a book and it was about great <laughs> extraterrestrial biological entities manipulating DNA to create the dinosaurs. So these are these pieces that come together over sometimes these many years. I was hypnotized. I did see a document that seems to resonate with other information later and that I came uh, to respect the hypnosis that Bud Hopkins was doing, that uh, Dr. John Mack was doing uh, others, I have been in, oh, I, I probably have personally been in 35 or 40 hypnosis sessions with people who are going under to recall what happened in the face of non-humans and what happened in craft or what happened where they went. And after a while, you begin to have, I think, a serious respect. Uh, another person who's doing great work is Kathleen Martin and then Lester Velez in Opus. Uh, they have a series of hypnotherapists that they are trying now to pair up with people who would like to explore with hypnosis. And all of that is in uh, these previous Earth Files YouTube channels. And then Bob Salas with the work that he's going to do at the National Press Club in Washington, it sort of links to these issues does hypnosis take us to truth? I think it does to a large extent. He, uh, Bob wants to see if we could have a, a congressional hearing with all of the military people who have been inside of these experiences with Minuteman missiles and UFOs present. So they're all facets of the same big sort of complex, uh, every, every part seems to be moving and accelerating of this revolution that something is getting ready. We are one way or another. Humans are going to be introduced to advanced species and advanced technologies. That's a fact. So all of these pieces, including my own personal exposure to hypnosis, which seemed to me to prove that at least one part of it was that vivid. And then I had facets that sort of bo boosted up the reality of what I was reading. 
And that's why it takes a lot of time to get a picture like the Pontalisme that today there's so much that I, be, I feel like I'm beginning to understand a much bigger picture for the very first time. And I just keep trying to bring facet after facet to you guys and hope that altogether we will be able to increase at least positive interest in trying to understand the other in all phases, in all forms, and knowing if the universe is conscious and our brains can resonate and all life forms resonate and there's a mathematical matrix in it all, prayer, feeling a divine field, It's so important. And I pray for all of you that we all can continue going forward, evolving positively. And I'm so glad that we got to share tonight. And I'm right at the bottom of the hour or half hour. And I'm going to close this out uh, tonight on the time, Ian. But next week, I am planning to take, uh, like in various facets from you guys, some of the more fascinating letters on orbs and uh, balls of light and NDEs, and I'm going to share some of them next week because I want you all to know how valuable it is to hear from you. And if you don't always hear from me, it's because, and Ian and Brad know this, uh, I get a black river of email every day and I really work hard at keeping up, but sometimes uh, just have patience with me. I end up reading as much of your communication to me as I possibly can. And I'm just going to work at periodically taking and sharing back to you for more because that is the way I learn and I would love to be able to share that with you. And Ian, uh, as we are going out right now, uh, do you have any closing comment in what you have been looking at the chat that you might want to share? All I'd like to say is to emphasize again what you've been saying to please keep sending us the reports and experiences and we'll try and get through as many questions and uh, and responses as we can. So thank you as well to everybody who's contributed this evening. And thank you. And uh, prayers. Most positive frequencies. Just concentrate on the most positive frequencies. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Turn on closed captions for YouTube videos by clicking the white CC button on the lower right. The default language for Linda's videos is English. If you would like to see the captions in another language, click on the white settings button next to the CC button. Select subtitle CC and then select auto translate. I don't have to put them in select the language or, uh, bind them anywhere they love and the captions them. will now appear in that language sort of gone through and they will hold their heads I never had a cat do that before and they'll pull against the comb helping me get out snarls and I think it's the best they've ever been <laughs>